Hey guys, and welcome to my analysis of the second Fazbear Fright book. Now, we've gone, gone through all three and a half stories of uh, Into the Pit, and I've just dived into Fetch as soon as possible. Uh, I say that, but it's taken about a week. <laughs> Today, we're going to go through Fetch. Um, I just finished it. Uh, mad story. These stories are actually a lot longer than Into the Pit, but that, that doesn't mean anything. Um, it really, it didn't feel longer. It felt like the same kind of story length. Um, but it was a little bit more creepy, I feel. I feel like cause Scott is stepping up his game uh, every book. Um, although he's only released two books so far, so um, I can't say anything. But really, I, I do think this is a really good story. Um, and there are parts... I don't know if this one's going to fit into the lore that much. Because it introduces just a completely new animatronic that we've never heard of, never seen before. And there's not really much connection to the games. Um, but we, we'll see where we can go with it. Um, so without further ado, remember there are spoilers ahead in this video. Um, I always forget to mention that when recording this, but there are spoilers for potentially all of the stories up to Fetch, um, but probably only just Fetch. So um, if you want to read Fetch first for yourself and get your own reaction, you can do so. Anyway, let's begin. I'm going to go through the story like normal as it, as it explains it. Um, I feel like that might be a bit easier, on my part at least. Um, so we start off at this this really strange building, um, I mean you can see where this is going already, uh, all of the walls are crumbling and it's raining, It's, it's basically, there's basically a thunderstorm uh, and this building is on like, it, it's, it's in like a town kind of next to the ocean um, and these three friends are there, um, one of them is called Greg who is the main character and then there's Cyril um, who is always pessimistic um, and there's the other one which I've forgotten the name of Heidi uh, Heidi who is always optimistic so those two are kind of like opposites I think uh, anyway they, they search a little bit uh, and they see that uh, there's a sign on the building um, and they can see the letters F and R obviously that means it's Freddy Fazbear's Pizza that was obvious from the start um, and they see drippings over the walls and they're asking if it's pizza sauce or something else. Uh, they don't know much about this place, um, it's very unknown to them. But the weird thing is, um, Greg as the main character was drawn to this place. He doesn't really know why he's here, but he was drawn here uh, by some force or something. Now the weird thing about this pizzeria is it was shut down. Obviously I said it was abandoned, um, all of the walls kind of look like they're crumbling down, there was a like a roof, part of a roof missing or something. Um, but all of the stuff was still here. So you would walk into the kitchen and all the plates, all the forks, all the knives, everything would be there. And they were just asking why? Why, why is all this stuff here? Why has somebody just left all this here and shut down the pizzeria and not taken it all, you know? Um, the weird part is it's all covered in dust. So it's almost like the pizzeria was shut abruptly and um, nobody really did anything about it, they just shut down the place and left. Um, maybe a threat? Don't know. Um, there's this black cu black curtain uh, on the back of the stage uh, that was drawn closed and they see it move at one point. Um, but they don't, they don't really, they, they're like, this is too creepy, we don't want to check that out. Then, this is um, like the, the foundations of the story, they go over to um, the prize counter in this pizzeria. Um, so it's very familiar places, um, kind of parallels to the game as well. Um, and they see this strange animatronic thing under a top prize sign. So Greg picked it up and it was heavy. Its fur was, uh, its fur felt matted and coarse. He was oddly drawn to the animal, whatever it was. He studied the pointed ears, sloped forehead, long snout, and piercing yellow eyes. Then he noticed the blue collar around the animal's neck. Something gleaming dangled from the collar. A dog tag? 
He lifted it. Fetch, Haley read over Greg's shoulder. It's a dog named Fetch. And <laughs> he describes it as looking like someone uh, crossed the big bad wolf with the shark from Jaws. That's kind of accurate. That's a very accurate description. It's kind of creepy in that sense. And then they find this small booklet inside, inside of this animatronic um, and it's the instructions. It's the instructions on how to use it because actually this dog, it's, it's very extraordinary. It's different to the other animatronics um, because you can sync up the animatronic to your phone and it will retrieve information and other things. They think it won't connect to their phones um, because it's older tech, which is a point. That's a good point. But Greg picks him up um, and kind of just presses loads of buttons. Uh, and this is a really weird point in the story that's never really explained, but I think I've got an explanation for it, kind of. Basically above the fetch is this, this water stain. Um, and they shine their flashlights. They got these flashlights because, of course, it's dark. Uh, it's a bit like in the other books. Um, they look at the ceiling, and this is the only wet patch. And they're like, how? How is it the only wet patch? Because it's pouring down in rain. It's literally like there was a whole page about how it was pouring down in rain. And it's basically battering the building. So how are, isn't everything dripping? Um, there's just this one spot and it's above fetch um, and I think it's got something to do with like remnant basically yeah he, he's just pressing loads of buttons and it doesn't seem to be doing anything and then suddenly fetch moves um, and then then his gaping tooth filled mouth opened and he growled so it's he's activated now he's, he's activated um, and and they all all of the friends just agree to kind of take a step back because they don't want to get involved in any of this. Um, but then they kind of look around the building a bit more, shine their lights, and then they're like, okay, let's just leave, we don't want to do any more. But Greg's kind of disappointed, he's like, oh, I swear I was meant to do more than just come to this place and see this this dog animatronic. Um, the the last quote of this this main section is, had he done what he was meant to do? Which is very weird. Um, it's almost it's like the first story in the first book, um, where Oswald was drawn to the pizzeria. Remember that. So all the boys get home, um, and Greg comes home to to his uncle Darren, um, who's basically basically his dad, because his his dad doesn't really care about him that much. Um, his mum is kind of in the middle, um, but his uncle Darren is amazing, he's, he's a rich guy, um, he has loads of things, he has such a great connection with Greg, um, and he also has this, this lucky finger, they have this like, this joke in the family, um, about him having a lucky finger, and how, um, th th it's how he gets so much money, he basically, the uncle didn't really care that, um, Greg came home um, and wasn't answering his calls because basically um, his uncle was calling him like where are you where are you and he was in this he was in this establishment but he couldn't hear the the calls which was really it's a really odd detail because the calls were going off but he couldn't hear them but why because it was silent in there so that's something weird. Um, there's a few things about Darren, but we're gonna kind of skip past this um, because we don't really need. To, I've mentioned quite a bit of this, not really, but <laughs> ah yes. And next door to his house, um, the next door neighbors have a dog, a pet Shih Tzu, um, and it, although it's a very small dog, it's very aggressive towards Greg. It's always attacking him. Uh, and one time it attacked him and bit him in the ankle, I think it was. Yeah, it bit him on the ankle, he needed to have ten stitches. Apparently the dog has one missing eye as well, which is a strange detail. Um, foxy, no. Uh, so now we get on, a bit onto who Greg is and what his deal is. Um, he's, he's a very science-y guy. 
So in his room he has, I, I like science you guys, in his room he has like shelves of plants uh, and he also reads a lot about the zero point field which is a, a quantum physics term. Um, I personally don't know that much about it, I've researched a little bit into it and I think I can get, I, I, I do A level physics, I, I know a little bit about quantum physics but not much about the zero, field, uh, the zero point field. But um, we're going to learn a bit more about that later because it comes into play, but he's a very sciencey guy and he believes in um, all this different science. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. Cleve Baxter. Um, he believes in Cleve Baxter's experiments. If you want to know what he does, then, then go but uh, then go look at him. But um, basically, it says that plants can detect humans' thoughts. It's really hard to explain. Um, it's actually explained really well in this book, but I need like a quote or something. Anyway, we know he's a very sciencey guy. Um, he goes to advanced scientific theory um, at school, um, along with his friend. He was a teacher's pet as well, that's something to know. Um, he loved the periodic tables and the constellation posters on the walls. He loved the smell of the fertilizer that fed the hybrid plants growing at the back of the room. It made him think of science and learning. It's a bit like me, it's a story of my life. I'm not a teacher's pet though, definitely not. Basically, Greg is the only one that really gets it. Because Mr. Jacoby, who is his, his advanced science theorem uh, teacher, um, starts talking about the zero point field, and then Greg's like, yes, finally, we're getting onto this. Um, and he keeps nodding enthusiastically, and everybody else is like really confused, but the teacher takes his word for it. Um, but there's also somebody else who uh, it, who is nodding, uh, and this is and this person is called Kimberly Bergstrom. Bergstrom. Uh, Kimberly. Kimberly is Greg's crush, basically. Um, they are appropriate for each other. To, to be fair, they are nerds. But, um, and then uh, when this class is over, something very strange happens. Um, Greg gets a text, uh, and it says, Hello Greg, how are you? Um, the one thing I need to know in all of this thing, in all of this, is all of the speech across text messages is very, like, 21st century. So, instead of, like, writing you, as the word you, it's just the letter U, uh, and thank you is T-Y. It's very modern day um, messaging. So I don't know when this takes place, but it must be in, in the 21st century, right? Um, but again, I don't know, that's just a theory. A game theory, anyway. So when he asks who this person is who's texting him, they reply fetch. Wow. wow, okay, that's a surprise. So Fetch is texting him suddenly. Um, but he thinks it's all a prank. He's just like, oh, very funny, uh, Hades. But Hades like, what? It's not me, I swear. I'm not doing anything. Do you, does it look like I have my phone out texting you? Uh, why would I text you from like a meter away? Um, and then the Fetch is just texting him. Why do you leave? Which is very creepy. Greg was pretty creeped out by these texts, but he didn't really want to tell his friends all about it. Um, not now, anyway. Um, but he was he was really questioning if someone else was in the restaurants on that night. Um, and th there was there was something I forgot to mention. There was a, there was a slamming door as they left. Um, so they think that someone was there. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of text coming through from Fetch over the next few days. Um, Greg says that he needs more time to do homework, and Fetch sends Greg a link to a time management article, which is brilliant. Um, Greg is looking up these REGs online, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and there was this link that Fetch uh, gave again, uh, and when Greg finished the article. Uh, he started writing in binary, because funnily enough, REGs are to do with binary. We'll go through that in a second, as I say. In fact, we'll go through that now. 
Um, because it talks about it now. Um, basically, REGs measure whether a person can think hard enough to have an effect on an outcome in the physical world. So, basically, an REG will pick up the human brain signal, the signals coming from the human brain. It would, it would, it would go through a zero-point space. Uh, what was it called? A zero-point... Oh my god, I'm so bad at this. It would go through a zero-point space, right? And then it would go into a computer, and if it was strong enough, it would generate ones and zeros. And then, because that's binary, it will translate it into a message, um, and that's what an REG does. And throughout this story, you come to find out that that's very much like what Fetch does. I'm not going to spoil anything yet, though. The first weird, weird, weird happening is Greg tells his mum that he wants a chocolate bar, but his mum's like, hmm, I'm not going to get you a chocolate bar because that's unhealthy. I'm going to get you an apple. So she does her online shopping. She's like, do 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 um, Pay, shop. But she doesn't order a chocolate bar. Then, when the package comes, there's a chocolate bar. And so Fetch is actually being good. He's, he, he's listening into Greg's life. Which is very creepy. He's, he's stalking Greg. Uh, and he's listening to everything he's doing. And somehow, he's transferred his... Uh, like, like, just like an REP. Um, R REP. REG. He's got the message, and he's he's done something about it. He got Greg a chocolate bar. So, it's it's very strange. So basically, a few days go past, um, and he's still been getting texts, like a lot of texts from Fetch. Uh, and then the family decide to have a picnic. Uh, and Greg being Greg, or this is an inside picnic, by the way, an inside picnic because it's still raining, uh, the storm is still here from from before. Um, they all have an inside picnic, and Greg being Greg, decides, uh, I'm going to get a rubber spider, and I'm going to put him by my picnic. Don't know why. Like, why? Why would you do that? But uh, this four-year-old, I think it's his cousin or something, I don't know, he's, he's called Jake. Uh, Jake is like, no, spider, I don't like it. So Greg's like, okay, I'm going to remove it, because cause you say you don't like it. I guess I'll just have to remove it then. Uh, so he digs a hole in the mud outside when it's raining uh, and buries this spider. Odd detail, I don't know why you need to do that, um, but fair enough. Everyone was talking about the school bully who hated spiders. Uh, and they were like, okay, we need to prank him. We need to prank him, we need to get a, um, a spider. And then Greg's like, you know what, I've got a spider. Uh, I just dug him in my backyard a few days ago. Uh, I'll go get him if it wasn't raining. Um, and then, when when he's like, okay, I'll see you at your house. Um, he goes out the front door, looks down, and there it is. The rubber spider is there, on his doormat, in a plastic bag. But the weird thing is, the plastic bag has claw marks on it, so it's obvious that Fetch was the one to get the, the rubber spider for him. So again, he's, he's connecting with him, probably through the phone, and he's, he's doing stuff for him. Um, but it is crazy. This story is very original, I really like it. The part I love is, uh, the next thing that Fetch does is text him, Merry Christmas! <laughs> this is the point where where Greg's like, I have to talk to my friends, I need to, my friends to know about this now. He tries to explain it, it's, it's very hard to explain, they all think it's a joke. He even, he prints out like, screenshots of his phone, of his text messages, uh, and shows them to him, and they believe him now. And they say, oh, it's just syncing to your phone, it's, not, it's no big deal. But then Greg's like, no, it's... It's not. It, it's not just sinking to my phone. It's sinking into my entire life. It's literally like a god just looking down on me and looking at everything I do and giving me things when I ask for them. So now he realises he needs to be careful on what he asks for. You need to be careful what you wish for. They, they debate 
whether there was a person uh, in the pizzeria while they were in the pizzeria. And then, and then um, Fetch tells them E-L, which stands for Evil Laugh. Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting chills. The, the thing about this story is it's pretty bad all the way through it. Like, the other ones, it didn't get straight into it, but this one has just gone into in, straight into the deep. I like it. Anyway, Greg is like, oh, I, I really hope that I'm paired up with my, with my crush um, in class, uh, in this classwork about REGs. Um, and then he's like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And somehow it happens. Greg is going crazy. He's like, the world is listening to me, uh, in a way. And that's, yeah, that's going along the, the world of REGs as well. Okay, now we get to the, to the, to the part. Um, okay, so he comes home one day from school, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, the dog from next door jumps over the fence and is so aggressive, he's running, running after uh, Greg, then he, try, he tries to bite him, he doesn't manage to bite him quick enough, but he pushes the dog over the fence again, so that he's safe. Um, then he tells his friends, he's like, oh no, I almost just got killed by this dog. And that night, he has a nightmare. He spends a, a night in an abandoned pizzeria being chased alternately by Fetch, a faceless man, and the dog next door, while plants grew so fast inside the restaurant that the place turned into a jungle. On the stage, an REG spewed out zeros and ones, almost too fast for the eye to register. So, it's almost like PTSD. <laughs> There's a lot of things going through his mind, and that's just kind of showing that uh, through a dream. When he walks outside, he sees what's there and pukes in a bush. He, he's vomiting for so long, and it is in this is very well done, Scott. Um, he looks down at the doormat and sees the dog from next door dead. There are bite marks on him, and, and the dog's just dead. And it's it's obvious that it's Fetch that has just killed this dog, because um, Greg was like, Oh no, I was just in trouble, this dog tried to kill me. Um, so Fetch was like, I can sense that, I'm going to kill this dog. And then the thing that Fetch says to uh, to Greg after this is, You're welcome. This it's get cre It gets creepier and creepier by the minute. This is a very, very crazy animatronic. So then all the friends go back to the restaurant and they don't really know why Greg has bought him bought them there, but they, they go with like baseball bats and knives and stuff just in case someone is there. Um, and they think someone is. Uh, and then they explore the pizzeria. Basically Civil has done uh, a little bit of research about about this pizzeria and it was part of a pizza chain that got closed down after something bad happened to one of them. Obviously that's the missing children's incident. Um, I don't think it could have been any bites uh, of any of any sort, by 87, by 83. Uh, I do think it's just the missing children. Uh, and then they, they suddenly hear this big clashing noise from one of the rooms. So they go and explore all of the rooms. Uh, they go into a control room, um, which has nothing but these like computer screens um, that are all off. They're all uh, not powered and stuff. Then they go into one marked security. Uh, again, it was the same thing, nothing worked. Then they go into storage. When they go into storage, they open the door, and they're all shocked at what they see. They see four gigantic animatronics, five times the size as Fetch. Fetch is basically the size of a, an average dog. Um, and they see these animatronics um, just gazing at them. They're in a storage room, so if you think of like the one in the FNAF 1 death screen, maybe, or in the FNAF 4 um, minigame. It's a bit like that, where they've got uh, loads of animatronic parts around, um, and just all of these robots and suits and stuff. Um, it, I, it said it was filled with suits. Suddenly there was a humming sound around the room, um, and then they, they, they are flashing the torches, um, all over the room to see where it's coming from 
then they see one of the animatronic characters move their leg, um, and then this something was like shooting around the room, uh, barking, and then the, like leaving the room, um, and then it just disapp disappeared from view. Um, when they go to the place where they found Fetch, uh, where he was when they left them, uh, he wasn't there. They, they ran out the building and they saw this other dog. I don't understand this part. I, I actually don't. There's just, just, there's just this other dog uh, around the fir trees, uh, around the abandoned building, uh, just barking. He needs help on his Spanish, so he texts this, uh, this new kid, Manuel, uh, who, we, who we talked to and they exchanged phone numbers before, uh, he texts him asking for help. Um, but then he's like, oh no, <laughs> oh no, I've just asked Manuel for help over a text. Fetch is going to see this. He's going to think, oh, let's go retrieve Manuel, bring him here and kill him. Um, and so he's like, oh no, I need to go to his house right now. But it was... There, there was nothing. Uh, nothing. Nothing happened. Like, there were a few suspicious moments when we thought that something was going to happen. Like, there was a barking dog. Uh, and the door was wide open. But, um, Manuel was just in his shed, I think, without his phone. So he wasn't responding to his phone. Uh, and he had a dog. Um, one thing to note, his, dog is, his dog's name is Oro. Which, I looked up, uh, is gold in Spanish. Don't know if that's got any relevance. I don't think it does, but... That's a very nice, nice thing to mention. Uh, nice attention to detail, Scott. And then, yes, we're almost there. Okay. Whew. So, Greg talks about how he needs money. He's like, oh, I, I really wish I had money. So he texts his uncle, who's obviously very rich, uh, and he and he says to him, um, "How do you make money?" Can I have your lucky? F can I have your lucky finger or something? Um, oh, the magic finger of luck! And can you teach me how to make money? Um, and then he falls asleep. Um, but the uncle doesn't respond. He wakes up at four thirty, and goes, "I'm such an idiot. The last text that I sent to my uncle." probably just killed him. Uh, and so he runs, he runs, he runs so far away. <laughs> uh, he runs out to his doorstep and there it is, the finger. Just the finger, just a disembodied finger. Um, and it was, it was his uncle's finger. Um, and then his mum talks to him about how his uncle has been scratched all over and something bit his finger off. Um, it's such a crazy story. He goes outside, and there he is, Fetch himself. So he goes inside, gets a baseball bat, he takes one step, wait, I need to find the... He, he, he took one step toward Fetch, then another, and another, and then he was sprinting full out. Fetch stood, eyes bright, he looked at Greg, and then he just starts battering him. Like, genuinely, he, like, he takes off the face, face plates as well. You can see all of the mechanics, all the wires, as he's just beating him up. And while he's doing this, while he's just battering Fetch, Fetch is just staring at him, like, he, he just kept on going until it was just a pile of scraps. Uh, then he covered it up, he put the, he put the baseball bat down, uh, he covered it up, um, and he thought that was it, that's, that's the end of Fetch. But then he realises that he woke up really, really late the next day. Uh, he missed school, basically, uh, and Kimberly was looking. When he eventually left the house to go to Kimberly's house to study for school, he got a, he got a text from Fetch, will receive. So Fetch is somehow still alive, but he realises that he's been texting Kimberly, and now Fetch is going to kill Kimberly. What? <laughs> So he rides his bike as quickly as possible, all the way to Kimberly's house, um, and nobody is there. No, nobody's at the house. And when the family of uh, of Kimberly's get home, um, Kimberly's dad finds Greg, and he's like, 
kiddo, what are you doing here? Um, and then Kimberly's like, Greg, why are you at my house? Uh, and it, it's, it's a weird interaction and I, and I really, I feel sorry for Greg, I really do, he didn't do anything wrong. Um, he was just called to this pizzeria uh, and suddenly all this is happening. And then he tries to explain the entire story to Kimberly and Kimberly's dad is like, stop it, kid, stop. Oh, no, 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 but, but this dog, uh, I, I saw him at a pizzeria, I broke into the pizzeria. Kid, stop, or you'll get arrested. Uh, no, but he, he, bit, he bit off the finger of my uncle. Stop. At once. Uh, and then, basically, he phones the cops uh, and wants to get him arrested. <laughs> Um, which is which is a turn that I didn't think would happen, honestly. And he got home fine, he wasn't arrested or anything. Um, uh, Greg pulled on a yellow t-shirt and a pair of grey flannel sh uh, sheep? I cannot speak today. Sleep pants. Then he threw open the bathroom door, barely containing a scream. Greg stumbled away from the door and fell to the tired, tiled floor his mind struggling to accept what he was looking at. There was something wrapped in a sheet, laying across the doorway. As he stared, the once beige sheet was turning a deep, dark red, and it glistened wet in the room's muted light. Who was under the sheet? What was under the sheet? Greg couldn't get himself to move so he could find out. Greg didn't need to look any further. He knew everything he needed to know. The phone on Greg's bathroom counter vibrated. He couldn't help himself. He picked it up and looked at it. Fetch had texted, see you. Is it just me? I'm really stupid by the way. Is it just me or do I not understand the ending? <laughs> um, you guys might need to tell me what that kind of last section means. I don't know if I'm such an idiot, aren't I? I think it is Kimberly, by the way. I think it is just Kimberly under a cover, because uh, somebody's bleeding under there. Why did Fetch say see you? I don't know. Maybe he's about to die? Don't know if it's a cliffhanger or not. But um, I certainly don't really get this story, apart from the fact that it's just an animatronic that's going completely savage. Do I think the animatronic is possessed? Of course, because um, it's FNAF. <laughs> um, I don't think the intention of Fetch, by the way, was to, you know, kill people and stuff. I think I think the animatronic turned savage. Um, but it is so weird. <laughs> it is honestly... I think it's the weirdest story. I, I really don't know. Tell me guys what you think about this story. Did you like it? Did you not? Uh, do you have any theories on it or how it connects to the main games? I really don't. I don't. I don't really get the ending. But um, <laughs> I, I think I'm just stupid. So, so tell me, guys, what you think, uh, and I will see you when I analyse the next one, which is Lonely Freddy, which I've heard is a good one. <laughs> I will see you next time. Goodbye.